The sutta tonight is called the exposition of a summary. Thus, if I heard on one occasion a blessed one was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pandika's Park. There the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. <laughs> I love electronics. <laughs> Anything to do with electricity, it doesn't work for me. I, I turned on the light, he came in, yeah. he turned a, a light bulb, and then it worked. <laughs> yes. uh. Monks, I shall teach you a summary and an exposition. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the monks replied, the blessed one said this. Monks, a monk should examine things in such a way that while he is examining them, his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor stuck internally. And by not craving and clinging, he does not become agitated. His consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor stuck internally. And if by not craving and clinging, he does not become agitated, then for him there's no origination of suffering. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. Big mistake. They didn't ask him any questions. The monks listened to him, and always after he makes a statement, he pauses, and he's quiet, and he looks around. Nobody had any questions, so I'm out of here. Then, soon after the Blessed One had gone, the monks considered, now friends, the Blessed One has risen from his seat and gone into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. Oops. Now, who will expound this in detail? Then they considered the venerable Mahakachana as praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He is capable of expounding the meaning of this. I forgot, I gotta go to another. Then the monks went to the venerable Mahakachana and ex exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down at one side, and they told him what had taken place, adding, Let the venerable Mahakachana expound it to us. The venerable Mahakachana replied, Friends, it is though a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that 
heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of heartwood. After he had passed over the root and the trunk. So it is with you, friend, that you think I should be asked about the meaning of this after you pass the Blessed One by. When you were face to face with the teacher, for knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma. He is the Holy One, he is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time that you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning as he told you so you should have remembered it. Surely, friend Kachana, knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma. He is the Holy One, he is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, of the Tathagata. That was the time uh, when we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told us, we should have remembered it. Yet the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. The Venerable Mahakachana is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of this summary given in brief by the Blessed One without expounding the detailed meaning. Let the Venerable Mahakachana expound it without finding it troublesome. Then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the, the monks replied. The Venerable Mahakachana said this, <clears throat> How, friends, is consciousness called distracted and scattered externally? Here, when a monk has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness follows after the sign of form, and is tied and shackled by the gratification of the sign of the form, is fettered by the fetter of gratification, that means craving, then his consciousness is called scattered and distracted externally. When he's seen or when he's heard a sound with the ear, felt an odor with the nose, smelt, smelt an odor with the nose, tasted a flavor with the tongue, touched a tangible with the body, cognized a mind object with mind. Now this is something I want you to pay attention to because how do you get caught with thoughts? And how do you grab onto it without knowing it? And what are you supposed to do with it? You're getting pulled away from your object of meditation. And you don't even notice it. That's how your mind gets scattered and distracted. Don't do that. Don't make a big deal out of whatever arises at whatever sense door. This is real important. You make a big deal out of anything. You hear, hear voices in your head and you make a big deal out of it and start paying attention to it, your mind is distracted and scattered. 
your mind is not on your object of meditation. And it will cause you to become frustrated, distracted, agitated. And you make a big deal out of it. Now, if you have a sensation that arises in your body, what do you generally do with that? I don't like it. It hurts. I don't want it there. I want it to stop. I want it to, oops. Now, it's real easy to get caught up in feeling when it arises. If you get caught up in pleasant feeling, you like it too much and you hold on to it and you, you don't want it to go away because it feels good. But who's making a big deal out of it? Remember, mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another and you're not, you're getting caught up in that movement without recognizing it. It's a big problem. Restlessness is one of the bigger hindrances. And the more you make a big deal out of what arises in your mind and distracts you away, the more problems you have for yourself. The more you're causing yourself suffering, the more you're, uh, the slower your progress becomes. Now, hindrances are your teachers. And they're showing you where you have an attachment. What is an attachment? Always. An attachment is anything that has craving in it. Okay? So you have to start letting that go. Don't get involved with whatever pulls your attention away. You should actually be grateful for hindrances when they arise. Why? Because it's showing you where you have an attachment. Don't fight with the attachment. Don't try to control the attachment. Don't try to make the attachment be what you want it to be. Allow it to be there by itself. And you use the six R's. You recognize that your mind is distracted. Release the distraction. I don't care what it is. I don't care how enticing it is. Okay, just let it be there by itself. Don't keep your attention on it. Relax. Every time your mind has has a distraction, it has tightness in it. What is the cause of the tightness? It is craving. What is craving? It's the I like it, I don't like it mind. And it causes all kinds of problems to arise. After you relax, you let go of that tension and tightness, you'll notice that your mind is clear, your mind is bright, your mind is very alert, and your mind is pure. Why is it pure? Because you've let go of craving. The second noble truth, right? What's the cause of suffering? Craving. So you let go of that. Now your mind is open, your mind is pure, your mind is very alert. 
but there's nothing pulling your attention away. Then smile. Come back to your object of meditation and stay with your object of meditation. You have to be more sincere with staying with your object of meditation. It has to be, uh, that's, that's your home base. That is where you start really seeing more and more clearly how mind's attention does move. And when you see it starting to move, you let it be by itself. Relax, smile, come back. The more you do that, the more you're going to stay with your object of meditation without distraction. So it's real important for you to understand that little tiny things can be distractions just like big things can be distractions. If it's pulling your attention away, your mind's attention is moving. Then, as soon as you see it even begin to move, you relax right then. You let it be. You don't keep your attention on it. It's real easy to get caught up in thoughts or memories or whatever is pulling your attention away. It's real easy to get caught up in that. Now, as I was sitting watching you eat, I'm a sneaky monk, I was seeing a lot of people thinking. Why? Stay with your object of meditation. Don't let the food be the distraction that's going to pull you away and get you thinking about something else. Don't let whatever comes into mind be a distraction and pull you away. Because then you're going to start paying attention to that and you're not staying with your object of meditation. And your progress is going to be very slow. Hindrances are your best friend. Okay, it's not somebody to fight with, it's somebody to help you recognize, I have attachment, I am that. Oh, it's more important for me to stay with that. No, it's not. It's not important at all. It's just nonsense stuff coming through. Oh, but this thought is, I have to keep thinking this. Well, okay. So be slow with your progress. I don't care. It's you are causing your own distractions by getting involved and letting your, your object of meditation fade away. And you have to bring it up again. So it's a real important thing to deeply understand that movement of mind's attention that pulls your attention away is slowing down everything that you're you want to have happen with your meditation. You want to have a mind that's more peaceful, more calm, that stays with your object of meditation. Don't allow these other distractions to become infatuated with them and stay with them. 
okay. You're not, you're not being mindful at that time at all. Oh, but this is an important thought. I have to keep this one. No, you don't. Where did that thought come from? Where's mind? Do you know? Where is mind? Why does mind arise? Why do distractions arise? Why do things pull your attention away? Why? Because of craving. Okay. And old habits. And making a big deal out of things. Don't make a big deal out of anything. It's just nonsense stuff anyway. It's not important unless you make it important. And if you make it important, who has an attachment? Who's caught by that sneaky little craving? Be careful of making a big deal out of whatever arises. I don't care whether it's a mental thing or a physical thing. Allow it to be there by itself. Oh, I got an itch. I got to scratch it. Who has an itch? Who doesn't like that feeling? Who wants to change it? Who wants it to be different than it is? Or who likes it? And who wants it to stay? We have to be careful of these things. Because this distracts and scatters your mind's attention. Now this particular sutta that I'm reading to you right now is a road map of what happens in your mind. So listen attentively. And how, friends, is consciousness called not distracted and scattered externally? Here, when a monk has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness does not follow after that sign of the form, is not tied and shackled by craving, is not fettered by the fetter of gratification and liking, making a big deal and holding on to it, then his consciousness is called not scattered and, and distracted externally. When he has heard a sound with the ear, or smelt an odor with the nose, tasted a flavor with the tongue, any of these things, when you start paying more attention to that than staying with your object of meditation, you're not meditating at that time. That's what meditation is all about, staying with your object of meditation. Don't let these disturbances cause you to go away and get caught and now you're thinking about things a thousand miles away. Now, one of the really important things that I want you to understand is, and this is something I get criticized for all the time, is smiling. Where does it say in the suttas that you need to smile? It doesn't say that in the suttas. But, it helps your mind to be alert. It improves your mindfulness. 
Now, you've heard me tell, tell stories about people that they get distracted and they complain that their mind is just, it's running all over the place. Why? Your mind gets distracted because your mindfulness is poor. Your attention is not staying with your object of meditation. The more you smile all the time, I mean all the time, I, I don't care what you're doing, all the time, smile in your mind, your mind becomes lighter. Your mind is more agile. And that light mind helps you to have more joy arising. And joy is one of the enlightenment factors, so it's okay to have joy. I was told when I was, whenever I had joy arise when I was practicing the straight vipassana, the first thing I'd tell the teacher is, I got some joy, and this is great stuff. And you know what they said? Don't be attached. Well, that's really good advice. But the way they told it to me made me think that that was some kind of a hindrance, and it was something that I didn't want to have happen, so I pushed it away. I stopped myself from feeling joy. And when you have joy in your mind, your mind is very alert. Your mind is very, very light. When you have a distracted mind, your mind is heavy. Your mind starts to get hard. With joy, your mind gets light. Your awareness becomes much more alert, much more at ease. One of the problems that I had with other meditations, and I've done a lot of different kinds of meditations, was the heaviness of my mind. And when I was practicing with other people and doing uh, the other practices, I'd get up and start walking and I would see a lot of people really trying hard. And trying hard means you have a scattered, distracted mind. And that's one of the things that makes the meditation difficult. And it causes your mind to be really run around and think about this and that and get caught up in, th in your thoughts. And you start taking it personally and that hardens your mind. Joy and smiling. Smiling is the cause of joy arising. The more you can smile, the better your mindfulness becomes, the lighter your mind becomes, the easier it is to see distractions when they start to arise. And then, let it be, relax, smile, and then come back again. When I was teaching in England, a lot of the students, they, they weren't really getting it. After a couple, three days, I expected to see a lot more people smiling and I couldn't get them to smile. British, you know, they have a stiff upper lip and they have a stiff, a stiff upper mind. And to get them to smile, was, it was a major job for me to get them to do that. S 
Smiling keeps your mind light. Who said that life was supposed to be serious? Who said life is hard? It can be, but who makes it hard? Mm -hmm. <coughs> the harder it is you are on yourself, the more you criticize yourself, the more you cause yourself upset, the harder life becomes. Keeping your precepts is not just to be done while you're practicing your sitting meditation. If you saw truly how important precepts are <coughs> and the benefits you get from having good precepts, it's really, you, you would not even consider breaking a precept. And in Asia, there's this idea that, well, you always have to be polite to somebody else, and so telling little white lies is okay. You see somebody and they're they're wearing a new kind of new clothes and they're horrible looking on that person. Oh, isn't that pretty? That's a lie. You're trying to deceive the world. And that simple little statement causes your mind to go and now you have craving in it. And then you sit in meditation and guess what comes up? You have a hindrance come up. Why did the hindrance come up? Because you told a little white lie. And you took it personally. It's really an important thing for you to understand that this is an all the time practice. It's not just for sitting. And that's a hard one. It takes a while for you to realize how important it is and how much you hurt yourself. I'd, I've had some students that they like to curse. Well, every time you curse, what's in your mind at that time? Anger, dissatisfaction, dislike. I don't like it. And then you come and you sit in meditation and you get attacked by these hindrances over and over again. Why? Because you're playing at the meditation. You're playing a, a difficult game with your mind. And that causes a lot of suffering, dissatisfaction, dislike. Yeah, but I'm only, I'm just saying that. I don't really mean it, but your mind does. Your mind wants to purify itself. And the only way you can purify yourself is by keeping the hindrances without breaking them. When you keep your precepts without breaking them, there's so much benefit that you get. And I, I've had st uh, some students say, say, well, you know, I'm a salesman, I have to lie. 
<laughs> and my question to them is, what kind of reputation do you have? Well, people don't believe what I say a lot of the time. Yeah, well, okay. And you're doing that to yourself and you try to blame other people for your suffering. The reason that I really like Buddhism because it's the ultimate in self-responsibility. You can't blame somebody else for your problems. Yeah, but they said something I don't like, so? So I cursed them. Okay, now you have that dislike and that identification with that dislike. So you sit down and you try, start to meditate and you have all of this distractions coming over and over and over again. The thing that you have to really start to understand is the importance of practicing true meditation. What is true meditation? Meditation, it's got three parts to it. It's not about sitting quietly. Meditation is first off practicing your generosity. How do you practice your generosity? Oh, look out. The monk's talking about getting, he, he, he wants you to donate something to him. <laughs> you practice your generosity by smiling to somebody else and giving that smile away. By helping someone else that, so you can help them overcome their suffering. It's being nice. not walking around with a grudge on your uh, or a chip on your shoulder. It's being helpful to other people, being kind to other people, being grateful that other people are giving you an opportunity to help them so that you can overcome this stingy, idea that I'm more important than anybody else. When you help other people to smile and you help them to overcome their suffering, you're practicing your generosity. It's a very active kind of thing. Somebody drops something, you reach down and pick it up and give it back to them. You help them. It really is a wonderful thing when you practice it. You go into a store, you see some, uh, this happens to me a lot because I'm tall. I see somebody that's short that wants something on the shelf up there, so I give it to them. That made them happy. That made their mind let go of the dissatisfaction of trying to figure out how to get what they, they really want. You radiate loving kindness to other people with your daily activities. You're practicing your generosity. Give it away. What you give, you always get back, right? The more you can give your smile to other people, the more smiles that are going to come back to you. And that is meditation. So it's real important that you practice your generosity and help other people 
to overcome their suffering, whatever it happens to be. Sometimes it's just a simple thing, just saying something that makes them smile, makes them happy. I love to go into big stores and look up where some kids are making a lot of noise and being kind of a nuisance. I just start radiating loving kindness to them. I want this, I want that. And uh, the, the parents are like, no, you can't do that. So I, I stand close to them, not too close, but and I start radiating loving kindness to them. All of a sudden, the child settles down and they start looking around, who's doing this? I feel this, it feels nice. So the more you give your love to other people and practice your generosity in that way, the more you affect the world around you in a positive way. You get around people that are arguing. You don't have to even stand very close to them. Just start radiating loving kindness. And watch what happens. I mean, it's pretty amazing. They will stop and then they'll start talking, not being from an emotional state. And you keep radiating loving kindness to them until you see them smile or laugh. Then your job is done. Continue on. It's either that or walking around in your own hell. Your own, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I don't like this, I like that. This is one of the things that's happening in, in this country that I've noticed is a lot of people want to practice loving kindness, but the loving kindness they practice is mental. Okay, it's just words. Oh, may you be happy. But loving kindness is a feeling. and you radiate that feeling. And it's amazing to watch how, what happens. Not too long ago, I saw an accident happen on the road. So I asked the person that was driving to pull off to the side. And one person was hurt, but what happens if you don't keep your precepts? You get overexcited and you get highly emotional and you're not really very efficient with what you need to do. And I see people running around and they, they're being scattered. So just start radiating loving kindness. I'm, I'm on the other side of the road, just sitting there sending them love. And you can see that all of a sudden they all become efficient with what they're doing. They're not emotional. They're not overexcited because there's some kind of a, a thing that's happening with them. And the more you radiate loving kindness, the more they settle down and become calm and then they can be really helpful. Now one time I was uh, working on a roof and actually I went up on the roof to show somebody where to put 
safety ropes. And I fell. Now I was 20 feet in the air. And one of the things that I've, I've learned because of keeping the precepts is that when I was falling, my mind said, relax. And I relaxed my whole body. And I made a mistake. And I put my hand down like this. And I wound up breaking my wrist. So I'm laying on the ground. And this one guy that was working for me, he was really not good with keeping his precepts. And he really got excited. And he was doing exactly the wrong thing at the wrong time. And he runs over to me. And I'm holding my wrist like this. And he said, are you OK? And I said, yeah, I, I, I think I might have broken my wrist. And he grabs my hand, and he starts doing this with it. And I told him in no uncertain terms that he better find something else to do. Go away from me. Keeping your precepts is a kind of protection for you. OK? Now, one of the things that it says in, in the suttas that if you keep your precepts without breaking them, you're not going to die from an accident. You're not going to die from it. You can be in a car and all of a sudden, and if you keep your precepts without breaking them, you're not going to really get hurt. So this is a, another way of practicing your mindfulness. Practice your generosity. Start radiating loving kindness. In one of the suttas, it says that you, no matter what somebody else says to you, it doesn't matter. That's their opinion. They can have their opinion. They can be angry. They can be nasty. They can do whatever they want. But you take that person and you have compassion towards that person. You know what it feels like to be angry, right? What does it feel like in your body? Not real nice. Everything tightens up and you get red in the face. But you start radiating that compassion and loving kindness towards another person. What is compassion? Seeing another person in pain. I don't care what kind of pain it is, whether it's mental or physical. And allowing them the space to have their pain. I can't take your pain away. You can't take my pain away. But I can love you. So when you start focusing on loving kindness, the anger that somebody has towards you or the nastiness that they have towards you starts to soften. And the more you radiate loving kindness, the more their mind settles down and they become actually not so angry, not so mad, not so highly emotional. And then walk away. If you're focusing on loving kindness, you're not focusing on the nasty things they're saying to you. And you're helping them overcome their dissatisfaction in their own mind. So you just radiate loving kindness to them and use them as the reminder to radiate loving kindness 
to everybody in all the directions, all the time. That's practicing your generosity. That's helping someone else overcome their hindrances. Isn't that a nice thing to do? Isn't that a fun thing to do? Yeah. Not maybe. People start to notice that in you when you practice it. Again, this is part of the meditation. It's part of loving kindness. The second part of the meditation is keeping your precepts without breaking them. When you do that for a period of time, what happens is your mindfulness picks up and you know what you're gonna do before you do it, you know what you're gonna say before you say it, and now you have the choice of what you're gonna do and say. One of the advantages of keeping your precepts is when you sit and you get ready to do your sitting meditation, your mind is going to naturally tend towards tranquility. So, it's not just something to do on retreat. Life is meditation, meditation is life. So, you overcome this idea of having a scattered mind. Your mind isn't going to be so scattered and distracted. You're still going to have some hindrances come up. Why are you here right now? Why are you born into this life? Because in the past you broke precepts. And it's another opportunity to learn how to purify your mind. Having an uplifted mind, having joy arise, these are essential parts of meditating. Now, there is a lot of people that, that, in, that I teach in Asia that they have developed some real bad habits about their precepts. And as a result, their, their mind gets real scattered. And they're, they're very easily distracted. And they suffer so much. I mean, it makes compassion come up in me because I see what they're doing to themselves. So this is a real interesting phenomena, being able to take the six R's and use the six R's with your daily activities. Your mind will start to settle down. You're going to start to have more and more balance in your mind. Okay, you're going to have stronger and stronger equanimity. And that means that you're not going to have such strong emotional upsets. You can still get caught occasionally. And it can be shocking when you get caught by it. Where'd that come from? Well, it's from something in the past, some precept you broke in the past. It might be from... 20 lifetimes ago. It doesn't matter why it arises. Things happen. 
when conditions are right for this to arise, it will arise. What you do with what arises in the present dictates what happens in the future. If you fight with what's happening right now and you get into your anger and your dissatisfaction and get caught up in that emotional uh, habitual tendency, You can look forward to that coming up over and over and over again until you learn that that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Getting into your anger, your dissatisfaction, your displeasure with whatever it is, your fear, your anxiety. Let go of that kind of stuff. This is what mindfulness is for, to be able to see how this process works so you won't get caught from having your emotional upsets. And how long do you stay emotional? And how much pain do you cause yourself? And how much pain do you cause your body? Okay, doesn't, it's not very pleasant. That's the first noble truth. There is suffering, but it's your choice whether you suffer with it or not. There is pain, yeah. Welcome to the real world. We all have pain, we all have suffering, and it's okay for that to be there. It has to be okay because It's there. That's the truth. When a painful feeling, if it's emotional or physical, arises, the truth is that pain is there. What do you do with it? You fight with it? Oh, I wish it would stop. I hate this feeling when it comes up. Fear, anxiety, sadness, whatever it happens to be, allow it to be by itself. Don't make a big deal out of what, what arises. If you make a big deal out of it, then you're gonna start thinking about it. The more you think about it, the bigger and more intense that pain becomes. Pretty simple. Don't do that. <laughs> Allow the feeling to be there by itself. Now, this is a problem that a lot of people have with the meditation, is they want to control things. They want to make things be the way they want them to be. And they start fighting with it and they start trying to push it around and it's this feeling, this sensation, this thought, this idea. Well, the more you grab onto it, the more you make it into a big deal, the more you're going to suffer with it. So, instead of trying to control it, trying to make it better than it is, because I don't like this the way it is right now. Let it be there by itself. Did you ask that feeling to come up? Did you ask that emotion to come up? Did you ask that dissatisfaction to come up? Nobody's that dumb. Mm -hmm. You don't do that to yourself when your mindfulness is poor. You do. When your mindfulness is good, oh, that's, that's a painful feeling, that's a painful thought, that's, 
fear, sadness, anxiety, whatever it happens to be, don't make it in any bigger than it should be. It's going to come up. But it's not you. You didn't ask it to come up. You can't make it go away. So we have to start looking at a different way of handling these things. And that different way is use the six R's. Don't keep your attention on the distraction. Allow that distraction to be there. Allow that pain to be there. Allow that sadness to be there. It's only sadness. I didn't make up my mind and say, you know, I've been sad for a long time. I might as well be sad now. It comes up because conditions are right for it to come up. What you do with what arises in the present dictates what happens in the future. So instead of I have to control, I have to make it be the way I want it to be, you let it be there by itself. You relax. You smile. You wish some happiness. Oh, but it doesn't go away right away. Meditation pain. I, I love meditation pain. This, this stuff is great stuff. <laughs> Sometimes, and this is, it seems to be a favorite spot for an awful lot of people, is a pain in the bottom. And it can really be intense, and it can really be strong. And it gets so strong, I have to break my sitting. I just can't stand it anymore. Who can't stand it? Who doesn't like it? Who's taking it personally? Who's trying to control it and make it be the way you want it to be? When you make a big deal out of stuff, it gets bigger, it gets more intense, it causes more suffering. So, let it be there by itself. It's okay to have pain. It has to be okay, because that's the truth, right? When it's there, it's there. there. There's no getting around it. But as you allow it to be, and don't keep your attention on it, and let go of that tight mental fist around it that says, oh, I hate this feeling, and I'm going to do something with it. Like I told you yesterday, everything about Buddhism is this, not this. Okay, it's allowing that feeling to be there. Well, but I six R'd that pain and it didn't go away. <laughs> right? It's not supposed to. The pain will go away when it's going to go away. You can't control it. You can't make it be the way you want it to be by six R'ing. You can't use the six R's as some kind of stick to make things better and beat things away. <laughs> Allow it to be there. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it can be real intense. Is it, whose pain is it? Who wants it to be different than it is? Who's fighting with the truth? Who's trying to make the truth be the way they want it to be? I am. Who's suffering a lot? You bet. I suffer a lot because I don't accept what's in the present moment. Allow it to be there by itself. Smile. Laugh with it. Laugh at how silly your mind can be. 
because I want to control it. I want to make this stop. Well, laugh. Have fun with it. But it's painful. It hurts so bad I have tears coming down my face. I don't care. Let it be there by itself. It's only a feeling. And it certainly isn't your feeling, although you want to take it personally, you want to grab onto it and say, yeah, this is me and I got to make it better. Doesn't work. Allow it to be there. Develop your balance of mind, your equanimity. That pain will fade away pretty quick as you stop paying attention to it and just let it be there by itself. It takes two to tango. It takes two to fight. And how much, how many times are you at war with yourself? How many times do you take a thought personally and fight with it? How many times do you get caught up in that? You're going to keep being caught up in that until you learn that it's not yours personally. So just let it be there. Don't try to control. Don't try to make it different than it is. The truth is, whatever arises, it's there. So don't fight with the truth. Accept the truth. Oh, but it hurts. Yeah, okay. Now, when I was I was in uh, Malaysia. No, I was in Indonesia, and I got a hernia. So I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, "Well, I went to him in the evening. He said we have to operate in the morning." And I said, "No, I can't do that. Why?" Well, they've arranged for me to give a talk to a lot of people. And it took a lot of effort to get this many people in one place so that they could listen to me give a talk. No, no, you have to have you have to have this operation. No. You, I I'll take I, you can give me the operation but not tomorrow. I have to go. And there was, they had it arranged for 1,200 people to show up for this talk. And there was 2,000 people that showed up. And the doctor, he very reluctantly said, okay, I'll let you do that, but you got to be, we're going to put you in a, an ambulance and take you to the talk and then you get to go home by the ambulance, which was really ridiculous. I wasn't hurting that much. There was pain, yeah, so what? No big deal. And I was giving a talk and I started talking about the acceptance of what is happening in the present moment. And I said, you know that I, ha I have to have a surgery as soon as I get done with this talk. And there's pain, but so what? It's only a feeling. Oh, but this is a real pain. Yeah, it was real. It was there. So what? I can spend all my time fighting that pain. And what kind of a talk am I going to give to these people? That they came so that they could feel happy. Am I going to start complaining about, I have this pain here and it's, it's really bad and I'm, I've got to go have some surgery done. And I said, yeah, there's pain, so what? 
develop your equanimity to the pain. It's not yours anyway. I don't have any control over it. I can't make it be, I can't make it go away. It's real and it was there and it was a problem for my body. But, okay, so what? And I think that impressed an awful lot of people to think that I would be in pain and be able to give them a Dhamma talk that, that didn't have anything to do with negativity. They thought that was really something special and I, no, it's not anything special. You can do it for yourself. You can fight with the pain if you want. You can make it a big deal. You can cause yourself more suffering or not. It's your choice. So, after the talk, they, they wouldn't even let me walk 10 feet. They threw me in a wheelchair and pushed me around. Okay. And this was in Jakarta, and they have major, major traffic jams. I mean, really major. Some, sometimes it might take, to go two blocks, it might take 45 minutes. That's the kind of traffic jams that they have there. They have way too many vehicles. So it wound up taking about three hours to get back to the hospital. And then the, the, the guy that was gonna give me the uh, surgery, he said, are, are you okay? You know, you, you did all of this stuff and you gave this talk and then it took so long to get back. Are you, fine? Are you okay? Do you have any pain? I said, yeah. I have some pain, it's not that big a deal. Oh, you must be really brave. <laughs> no, it was only pain. It wasn't anything to get upset by. It wasn't anything to indulge in, or hate, or wish that it would stop, or wish that it would go away. It was just a feeling. And that's what every hindrance is. Hindrance rises, is a feeling arises first. Right after that feeling, it's either pleasant or painful. And then your perception is there. And perception is a part of the mind that says, when a pleasant feeling arises, this is pleasant. When a painful feeling arises, this is painful. Okay, I didn't allow my mind to start thinking about it. It's just this feeling, let it be. If I made a big deal out of it, that pain would have been really, really amazing. But as it was, it was like, yeah, it's there. And I was giggling and laughing and having fun on the way back. With, they'd start the, the siren going, trying to get people to move, and they didn't pay any attention to the <laughs> siren. It was kind of fun, actually. <laughs> but I could have gotten upset at that. Oh, it's just taking so long to get back. And I'm a worry about it. What good does worry do? Really? What is anxiety about? Why do we get so upset about some things? And cause ourselves so much suffering because of that? There 
years, I've, I've had students that have anxiety problems and they really get hit hard with anxiety. And this one lady, she came to a Dhamma talk and she was sitting in the middle of a group and she got hit by an anxiety attack. Now she said that when she gets anxiety, it generally, she goes into her room, she, she closes all the windows and all, all the curtains and there's a dark room and she's there for two or three days before the anxiety lets go. But she was in the middle of a Dhamma talk and she didn't want to cause people to get upset with her because they were, she would disturb them because she had to get out of the middle of the group. So she started thinking, you know, this monk, he's been talking about using the six R's. So I wonder what happens if I use it. And she was breaking out in a sweat and she really was uh, she was very nervous and, and kind of jerky motions. And she started six Ring that and the anxiety lasted about two minutes. And it went away. And she said, it always takes three days. How did that happen? Well, she stopped identifying with that p feeling that was painful. She stopped making a big deal out of it. She stopped fighting it. She stopped ma trying to make it do what she wanted it to happen. So, she let it be. She relaxed. She tried to smile. At first, she couldn't smile. Okay, fine. She started wishing herself some happiness. And her mind went back to it. So she did it again. And it lasted a couple of minutes and then went away. What is anxiety? Anxiety is a painful feeling that arises. I don't like that painful feeling. I want that painful feeling to stop. I get caught up in my habitual tendency of I always act this way when this kind of feeling and this kind of sensation occurs. But she stopped doing that. And she just used the six R's and she healed herself. She, I said, after, after the the talk, she was driving me back home. She said, I got an anxiety attack while you were talking. I said, okay, good. So? She said, but it went away. I said, good. No biggie. But you don't understand. Every time I have this kind of thing happen, it takes three days for me to overcome this problem. I said, so you use the six R's, huh? Yeah. Oh, remember to do that more. <laughs> Don't take these feelings and thoughts personally. Don't get involved in your thinking about because that's where your opinions start and that's where your, your judgmental mind really starts to cause problems. So, I'll get back to the sutta. And how, friends, is the mind called stuck internally? Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A person enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. 
if his consciousness follows after that joy and happiness born of seclusion is tied and shackled to liking it, then his mind is called stuck internally. Okay? Now what I generally do on retreat is I don't let you have enough time to do that. I, I push you along so that your progress is fast. So it's not too much of a problem. But when you get home and you get some joy arise and you really like it, you can get stuck with that. And that is an attachment. So let it be. Use the six R's. Yes, it's a pleasant feeling. Well, there's not much difference between a painful feeling and a pleasant feeling. It's still just a feeling. So let it be. Don't get involved in hanging on to it. I want this feeling to last. No, don't do that. You're going to cause yourself all kinds of problems. Again, with the fading away of joy, a monk abides in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. He enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. So when you, see, when you go through all of the different jhanas, you're going to be experiencing different meditations. Every step of every different jhana is a different meditation. Because there's different things that are happening you still stay with the same object of meditation. But you have other things that are happening. And you have joy, it gets real strong, you can start almost floating when you get into certain kinds of joy. But it's just a feeling. Let it be. Don't get involved with it. Don't hold on to it. Don't try to control it. This is the lesson of the meditation. So, and how, friends, is mind called not stuck internally? And it goes through the first jhana and it allows that feeling to be there by itself. Because it's going to change. The feeling is going to change. The joy when it arises is real nice when it's there but you don't keep your attention on the joy. You allow it to be there by itself. After a period of time, your mind becomes very tranquil and your mind becomes very peaceful and calm and comfortable. And you have more equanimity in your mind. Your mind doesn't get so distracted and pulled away. But don't hold on to it. Don't be afraid that you're never going to be able to get there again. You will. This is all part of the lesson. Okay. And how, friends, is their agitation due to craving and clinging? Hmm, interesting thing. Here, an untaught, ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for true men, who is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form or material form is in self or self as in material form 
that material form of his changes and becomes different. And his consciousness is preoccupied with the change of that material form. And you start to obsess with it. And you become concerned. And due to craving and clinging, you become agitated. So you have to prepare yourself for things to change. And it's, it's gonna. I mean, uh, one of the main things that is taught in meditation is everything is in a state of change. It's unsatisfactory because it's changing all the time. And it's impersonal. Anicca dukkha anatta. This is not a mental philosophy. This is a real thing that it happens this way. So be prepared. Things are going to change. And, and it, they'll change all by themselves. And because it's moving around and changing from here to there, it's unsatisfactory. I, there, there's suffering in that. But it doesn't matter. It's not you that's doing it. It does it on its own because conditions are right for it to act that way. Don't try to change things. Don't try to make them different than they are. Don't try to control anything. Allow it to be. And when you use the six R's and you use that relaxed step, now you're seeing the true impersonal nature of this process. You're seeing it up close and personal. Why would you take anything to be me as or mine? Why? You don't ask these things to come up. You don't ask thoughts to come up. You don't ask feelings to come up. You don't ask sensations to come up. Why do you take them personally? And what makes you think you're supposed to be in control of this process anyway? Allow it to be. Develop your balance of mind, your equanimity. This is the highest feeling that you can have, is equanimity. And as you start to go through the different stages of the meditation, your equanimity starts to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And you get into the Brahma Viharas and the six directions and you go through the loving kindness, the compassion, the joy, and the equanimity. Now your mind is settled. Your mind is very still. And there is that accepting, acceptingness. And you start to see more and more clearly that eventually the even the equanimity is too coarse of feeling for mind and then you're going to start being in that super quiet exquisite silence there's not going to be anything that distracts your mind and it can happen for a long period of time. I had a student in, in Malaysia. He was a heck of a meditator. He could sit for a long time. And when, he, when he went home after the first retreat I gave him, he would get up in the morning, he would sit for three hours. And he would go do whatever he had to do for the day. And when he got home, he sat for four hours. He sat seven hours a day. 
and he came to the retreat and he sat for four hours. Great. How much did your mind move? Oh, I didn't have anything. There was nothing in my mind at all. There was no disturbance. There's no movement of mind's attention. It was just peaceful and calm. I was impressed. <laughs> I can't sit that long with a quiet mind. But he was one of the happiest people I've ever met. He had this, I, every time he saw me, he would, he would come up and he would kiss me on the cheek because he thought I was giving him this, this strong equanimity and balance of mind. He said, you've changed my life. Well, I didn't change his life, he changed his own life because he really took the meditation seriously. And he, if he saw the slightest movement of mind's attention, as soon as he saw that, he would relax and just stay with the quiet mind. He was an amazing uh, meditator. It was really fun to be around him. He didn't have any more emotional upsets. He didn't have any lust. He didn't have any hatred ever arising in his mind. It's fun to be around people like that. It's, it's really inspiring. Of course, then, then that night, I got up at 2 o'clock, sat till 7 o'clock. No, nope, I still had some little tiny movements of mind's attention. Ah, darn. <laughs> yeah, maybe next time. But it was, it was so inspiring being around him that I started sitting for long. Five hours, six hours, great. Without having any sensation arise in my body. I didn't have a body. It was just quiet, peaceful. There's so much relief in having a mind that will be able to do that. And you can do that on this retreat. This can happen for you. All you have to do is follow the directions. They're pretty simple. They're pretty straightforward. Don't be attached to anything. Don't let anything distract your mind away. And I say don't let. That means six R until your mind gets like that by itself. Once you get into the arupa jhanas, that's that's the mental realms where you're not ha you don't have a body anymore. Once you get into that realm, everything gets to be more fun, and it really your mind just there's so much relief, there's so much balance in your mind. There, your mindfulness is super impressive. You don't get obsessed by anything. You don't have any disturbances. And sitting for an hour or two hours with a quiet mind is so much relief, it's unbelievable. And your mind naturally tends towards happiness because your mind is pure at that time. There's no craving that arises. So it's real fun. And I, you'd be surprised at how many people tell me, you know, I never believed that meditation, when there's nothing happening, can be that much fun. What relief. Well, you can do that. 
don't expect it to happen on the second day of the retreat, although that has happened with some of my students. They've been practicing for a while, they've take, taken retreats before, and then they come back and they do it again, and all of a sudden their mind just goes whoop, and quiet and nice and so much relief. And then they start saying, well, if I keep my mind on this, this just watching the peace and calm, there's a different kind of happiness that arises. And your mind becomes cool. Now, every time you use the six R's, you are experiencing, you ready? Nibbana. Nibbana? How can that be? Well, the Buddha in the fire sermon described everything as burning. What's it burning with? It's burning with craving. Well, every time you use the six R's, you let go of that craving. So your mind becomes cool. Ni means no. Bana means fire. So every time you use the six R's, you are experiencing a mundane Nibbana. You have to experience the mundane Nibbana quite a few times before you get to the super mundane, where there's real change, where there's real deep understanding. And the hindrances really don't, you understand hindrances. You understand how to let this kind of stuff go. You don't get caught with having distractions come in. That's what you can look forward to. And what relief. It's really nice. Okay. <coughs> he regards feeling as self. He regards perception as self. He regards formations as self. He regards consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in a self, or self as in consciousness. That consciousness of him engages and becomes, it changes, it goes otherwise. His consciousness becomes preoccupied with things. Distractions, isn't it? <coughs> so, the more you use the six R's, the more you cool your mind down, the more relief you will experience, the more balance in your mind you will experience. And this carries over into your daily life. Having this kind of equanimity where you don't get excited in a stressful situation. You know what to do at the right time and you do it. Sometimes the right thing to do is get out of the way for somebody else to do it. But you'll know what to do because you keep your precepts without breaking them and your mind won't become obsessed. So, and friends, is there non-agitation due to non-craving and clinging? And how is there non-agitation due to non-craving and clinging, excuse me? a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for his, the noble ones and is skilled and, and, and disciplined in their dhamma, who has regard for 
true men and is skilled and, in, and disciplined in their Dhamma does not regard any of the five aggregates as self. It's just an arising and a passing away of a phenomena. They, you don't take it personally. Actually, I don't like the, the use of the word self because that's so confusing and, and the, uh, the psychology of today is the ego and the superego and all the nonsense stuff. It's seeing the impersonal nature. And that is the main lesson that you get when you start seeing how the links of dependent origination work. When you start seeing the impersonal nature of this process, you start letting it go. And you have this mind that just becomes more and more settled, more and more at ease. So, so there are going to be changes that are going to happening, that are going to be happening, and it's okay for change to occur. It has to be okay because everything changes. Everything is in a state of change. When you get to certain places in the Arupa jhanas, you see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away at one of the sense doors, and you'll see it. You'll see that there is change that is constantly happening. And because there's change, it's kind of tiresome. But you also see the impersonal nature, and this happens by itself. As you let go of that false belief in a personal self, the ego. As you allow things to be without any distraction, now you're really teaching yourself major lessons. Now remember, you are teaching yourself how mind works. And you're, you're seeing that with your practice. Every time you use the six R's, you're seeing more and more clearly that th this is just phenomena arising and passing away. It's not me, it's not mine. But how much time do we spend causing ourselves suffering? And allowing that false belief in a personal self to take over our lives. Now you can get into a, a situation where you'll start to see for yourself that the meditation is changing you. You are changing you because of the way you're using the six R's. You're starting to see more and more of the impersonal nature of everything. And you get to a point where you become disenchanted with all of these different things. And that means you lose the excitement. But you have this great balance. And your mind tends towards happiness more and more on its own. It's really great fun to watch. It's great fun to see. And you can do that here. You can teach yourself these great lessons by 
Staying with your object of meditation when your mind gets distracted. Don't fight the distraction. Just six R and let it be and come back. Turn it into a game. Turn it into a fun game. That's what life is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be fun. Any time you have repeat thoughts, you have an you have a distraction. You have craving in your mind. You have something that you're taking personally and you're not letting go. So you have to see, no, let's let that go. It's, it's not that important. All of your opinions, all of your ideas, all of your thoughts, they arise because conditions are right for them to arise. What are you going to do with them when they arise? It's pulling you away from your object of meditation. So, I know what let's do. Let's use the six R's. Not get caught by it. Not try to hold on to things. Not try to be something. Just, there is something you can be, and that's happy. Because you're going to learn how to let go of this suffering. So, Let go of your preoccupation with the things that are supposed to be the way you think they're supposed to be. Because they are the way they are. Allow it to be there. Use the six R's. Come back to your friend. Come back to your object of meditation. Stay with your object of meditation. There's no confusion there. And this is way too simple. That's one of the complaints that I that that happened in in England. It can't be this simple. It has to be more complicated than this. No, it's not. That was one of the complaints that the Buddha had during his lifetime, because a lot of the Brahmins would come and they would be high spiritual beings, and they'd come with all these really naughty kind of questions and the Buddha, they'd start explaining this question to the Buddha and the Buddha would say, well, why don't you just let that go? I'm going to teach you the Dhamma. <laughs> and he, he they, they used to say that the Buddha had converting magic. And that magic is teaching people the way things truly are. It's simple. It's easy. Don't make it complicated. Just follow these directions. Make sure you get enough exercise. I'm real big on exercise, by the way. You see me hobbling around because my feet aren't good and my legs aren't so good. That happened because I followed my teacher the way he told me to do the practice. And I didn't get enough exercise. And I developed blood clots in my legs. I don't have blood clots anymore, but I still have problems. Because I didn't get enough exercise when I was sitting for long periods of time. So when, they, when you start sitting for a longer period of time, I'm going to make sure that you get enough exercise. I'm going to ask you about that. I want you to get, that's what you're walking for. I have no idea how it happened in, in Burma. Uh, when Mahasi Sayadaw was teaching the Vipassana meditation, he didn't teach people to walk slowly. 
he, he taught that walking is for exercise. You sit for a long period, you need to get your blood moving. But after he died, all of a sudden, everybody's walking really, really, really slowly. Well, that takes away the whole purpose of walking. You walk to get your blood moving again. And it actually, the more you get your blood moving, the better your sitting becomes because you get more oxygen into your brain. So I want you to walk at a normal pace. I don't want you walking slowly. And there were times that I tell people, run up and down the stairs a few times. Get your blood moving. And you'll see that it, it does make your meditation better. Some people come and they say, well, can I do my yoga when I'm... Well, are you getting enough exercise by doing that? By, by exercise, I mean, are you making your blood move around more? If you're doing it slowly and you're just holding different postures, you're not getting good circulation by doing that. You need to get your lungs pumping. You need to get your heart beating faster. Sometimes people come, is it okay if I go out for a run? Yeah, can you stay with your object of meditation? That's the only question I have. Stay with your object of meditation. I don't care what you're doing. Some people that they they well I I get good exercise when I when I do my yoga. Okay, depends on the kind of yoga you're doing, all of that kind of thing. Then my question is, can you smile and have fun doing it? If you can smile with it, okay, do that. Are you getting enough exercise? Are you getting in your heart beating? That's the, the main thing. Okay, so I've been talking for a real long time. A real long time. Okay, let's share some merit. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear-struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.